Steve Delabar never seemed like he was destined for all-star glory. He was drafted in the 29th round with the 851st pick in the 2003 draft by the San Diego Padres, but after spending six years in the minors, he fractured his elbow and quit baseball altogether. He went back to work as a substitute teacher and assistant baseball coach at his hometown high school, but his velocity returned and he ended up signing a minors deal with Seattle. Four years later, he found himself in Toronto setting numerous career highs. In the first half of 2013, he was 5-1 with a 1.58 ERA, and 57 strikeouts in 40 innings, which led all American League relievers. He was named a final vote candidate and won the contest with 9.6 million votes. In that same season, he also managed an immaculate inning against the Oakland A's, the second in Jays history and the 48th in MLB history to that point. Delabar managed all these impressive numbers while still allowing the highest rate of hard hit contact among all qualified relievers at a flat 40% rate. For reference, no other reliever eclipsed 37%. Despite not being one of the high-profile names at the All-Star game that year, Delabar actually got action and struck out Buster Posey in the seventh inning of the game. It was a big moment for Blue Jays fans everywhere. But his numbers speak for themselves. Among qualified relievers, he was 10th in strikeout percentage and 12th in strikeouts, and his 2.72 FIP and 73 walks were 23rd and 25th respectively. Delabar would never really replicate these nice numbers again, and 2013 was definitely his peak season as a reliever, anybody we've talked about so far. If you didn't get that one, don't sweat it. That's probably the hardest player we have on the list today. But for our next guy, let's stick with relievers and go with someone from Oakland that you might not remember. When I say Australian relief pitcher, most baseball minds nowadays would probably go to Liam Hendricks. But before him came Grant Balfour. After pitching for Minnesota from 2001 to 2004, Balfour didn't resurface until 2007. Initially being designated for assignment after spring training, Balfour would make the Rays club and turn in his best season to date, helping them win the AL East for the first time. He'd signed with Oakland in 2011, beginning his most memorable stint in the big leagues. He'd set the record for consecutive saves secured in franchise history with 41 saves in a row. Oakland A's fans were very endeared to the killer mindset that he had and the aggression that he showed on the mound, which sometimes got him in hot water. He'd finished the season 38 for 41 in save opportunities with a 2.59 ERA and three scoreless appearances in the playoffs that year. His 2013 All-Star knob was the only of his career, but A's fans went absolutely nuts for Balfour's raging competitive mentality. He's not a guy I'd like to step in the box against, that's all I'll say. He wasn't the most dominant of relievers, but he sure was effective, and one of the better closers the A's have had in their franchise's history. Nowadays, they manufacture bullpen talent left and right, so this is a little surprising. He'd return to the Tampa Bay Rays to close out his career. Let's stay on the topic of Oakland A's, but let's introduce our first hitter of the day, shall we? The Oakland A's playoff teams of the mid-2010s had some really lovable guys on those rosters, like Coco Crisp and Johnny Gomes, but the one that always comes to my mind is Brandon Moss. Moss's career was not looking bright in the early goings. After going hitless in five games for Philadelphia in 2011, it looked as though his career was going to be over after just five underwhelming years. He'd signed a minor league deal in December of that year with the Oakland A's, thus beginning the revision to his major league trajectory. Brandon Moss heavily considered retiring and becoming a firefighter, but nine days before he could opt out of his contract, he was called back up to the bigs. He posted a 954 OPS in 84 games that year and earned himself a starting role in 2013, playing full season seasons in both 2013 and 2014. Moss had an absolutely electric first half in 2014, hitting 21 home runs with an 878 OPS, thus earning him an all-star nod along with six of his teammates, some of whom I'll probably cover in later installments of this series. Brendan Moss would have a rough second half despite his decent power numbers, which is why this all-star campaign gets largely forgotten. He'd bat just 173 with four home runs in the second half to end his stint in Oakland and would play for a few more years before retiring. Still, it's nice that Moss got to live up to his potential and be the power that we all knew he could be as an Oakland day. Let's stay on course with power hitters and talk about our next guy at first baseman. Unlike some of the guys that we discussed prior, many people expected Justin Smoke to be a fantastic big leaguer. He was taken 11th overall in the 2008 draft by the Texas Rangers, and USA Today deemed him the best value pick of the first round that year. However, for the first seven years of his career, Justin Smoke appeared simply as a three outcome hitter, averaging 20 home runs per year, striking out a ton, and never posting an OPS plus above 115. It wasn't until his third year in Toronto that he finally started to figure things out. The switch hitting Justin Smoke compiled a monster first half for the Jays with a 296 batting average, 23 home runs, and a 936 OPS. Not only would this 
earn him the nod for his first All-Star game, but he'd be named the starting first baseman for the American League, with plenty of competition around him. He set a staggering career high for home runs at 38, shattering his previous high of 20. He'd also set career highs for RBIs at 90, batting average at 270, OPS at 883, and OPS Plus at 131. He'd never quite returned to this form of production, and he last played in 2020 for the San Francisco Giants, going 0 for 6 in 3 games. We haven't seen him in the big leagues this year, but it isn't impossible to assume that he might be back at some point. With hitting going the way it is, if Justin Smoke can recapture his 2017 form, that could be a very helpful bat to a contending team. Since he last played as a Giant, let's talk about another San Francisco Giant. When I say Giant starters, a lot of names come to mind. Tim Lincecum, Barry Zito, Matt Kane. The name Ryan Vogelsong is probably not the one that instantly came to your mind first. Vogelsong had one of the more interesting careers of any player we're discussing today. He originally came up in the bigs with the Giants in 2000, getting flipped to the Pirates in his sophomore season. He'd struggle as a Pittsburgh Pirate from 2001 to 2006, and would end up out of the league entirely from 2007 to 2010. A year after winning their first World Series in half a century, Vogelsong returned to the San Francisco Giants on a minor league deal. He'd be called up to replace Barry Zito and would end up having the best season of his career. His first start came against, you guessed it, the Pittsburgh Pirates. Vogelsong would go 6-1 with a 2.17 ERA and 1.16 whip in the first half, earning him a nod for the NL All-Star roster thanks in part to his manager Bruce Bochy representing the NL. The 33-year-old Vogelsong finished the season with a 13-7 record and a 2.71 ERA, the lowest among all Giants starting rotation pitchers. The same rotation that boasted Tim Lincecum, Matt Cain, and Madison Bumgarner. Though they wouldn't reach the World Series in 2011, they'd be back the next season, and in four starts during the 2012 postseason, Vogelsong recorded a 3-0 record with a 1.09 ERA twice getting the win in elimination games en route to the 2012 World Series title. He'd stay with the Giants through 2015, getting two rings along the way, with a career 2.92 postseason ERA in eight games. But the team he'd pitch his final season with? You guessed it, the Pittsburgh Pirates in 2016. Last up on our list is a Giants division rival, and our final position player as well. This last one kind of rubs me the wrong way just because I was so sure that Jake Lamb would be a star. He was a sixth round draft pick for Arizona in 2012 and had the doorway to the bigs open for him after Arizona traded away Martin Prado. In 2016, he hit 291 with 20 home runs and 61 RBIs in the first half and would end up being a final vote candidate, but he would lose out to division rival Brandon Belt and not make the All-Star team. I like to believe this was the catalyst for his 2017 All-Star Game Revenge Tour. He'd club 20 home runs in the first half of 2017 again with a 922 OPS to go with that. He didn't need the final vote this time, getting on the team as a reserve. Jake Lamb was one of just eight MLB third basemen to register an OPS above 840 from 2016 to 2017. Among those ranks were Josh Donaldson, Nolan Arenado, Chris Bryant, Anthony Rendon, and Jose Ramirez, among others. Pretty elite company. Between 2016 and 2017, Lamb would club 61 doubles and 59 home runs to go with a 113 OPS plus combined. However, these remain his only full seasons to date, as he's become a bench player through his battles with injuries. But he's still currently in the league, riding the bench as a member of the successful 2021 White Sox. If the door is open for him again, I have no reservations that Jake Lamb can still produce as an everyday player, but that remains to be seen. And that'll do it for today's video. Those were the six players I decided to cover. If you got none of them, if you got all of them, make sure you leave a comment down below letting me know. And again, I want to reiterate, if you have suggestions for other all-stars that may be considered forgotten, make sure you leave a comment down below. As always, guys, any and all support is really appreciated for the channel. So if you enjoyed today's video, make sure you leave a like so maybe someone else can find the video as well. We're getting really close to 20,000 subs, a thing that I did not think would happen in our first. So I just want to say thank you to all you guys for supporting the channel. It really means the world to me. All right, that's all I got for you guys today. I'm the Jolly Olive, and I'll see you guys next time.